JBN, we keep you informed. Jamaica's Most Wanted, Episode 8, Sandokan. It was the 1980s when the country was rocked by crippling austerity measures and structural adjustment policies had hit the impoverished areas of Jamaica. A new breed of criminality evolved. Communities in the lower section of St. Andrews, such as Waterhouse, Olympic Gardens, Tower Hill, and Riverton City, were all shelters for vicious woodlums. Life was unbearable for law-abiding citizens who had no choice but to live under the lawless rule of armed gangs and political thugs who laid waste to those areas by filling the void left by a poorly equipped and hapless police force. Many times these gangs would kill, rape, and terrorize residents with impunity. The actions of the police at the time, which include batterings and wholesale arrests, further compounded their fight against crime and alienated them from the communities that were under the gun. Out of this quagmire rose one of the nation's most notorious gangsters. His name was Wayne Smith, known more properly as Sandokan. At the time of Sandokan's short-term life of crime, residents of the era claimed they were in between the rock of police brutality and the hard place of plunder by the armed gangs which run amok in their communities. We couldn't take out the bad man, the Maguan. Them rape the woman, them, and rob poor people. Not to mention the whole heap of people where them kill. But the police sometimes no better, as when them pass through them no care who them kick up and broke button pan. Them kill whole heap of innocent youths and plant gun pan them too, one woman who lived in Waterhouse said. According to these residents, Sander Khan's emergence could not have come too soon. He bring order to the area and run with the man them who was going out with the ranks. He man him gang set the law because he never kill us with him power and treat all people and children with kindness, the woman said. But while other notorious bad men had shown a preference for brutality from a tender age, those who knew Sandakan say while he was a known ganja dealer, he was not one to murder and steal. He started out selling weed and he get crucial when a certain policeman tried to take over the weed business. Them try to arrest him one day but him escape and then lock up him woman, one resident said. Sandakan was reportedly riding a motorcycle with his wife as a pillion passenger when police officers signaled him to stop. Smith managed to wriggle out of the policeman's grasp and managed to escape, but the cops reportedly arrested the woman. The incident happened on November 19, 1986. Residents say Sander comes for into murder and bloodletting had its genesis in that narrow escape of the law. Reports began to surface in the community that Mrs. Smith, who was married to Sander Khan, at the age of 15 in 1985, was being boxed up by the police at the Olympic Gardens Police Station. The news infuriated the man who would grow to become the nation's most wanted fugitive and instilled in him an hatred for law enforcement. The following night, Sander Khan and his gang undertook what has been the most brazen attack at law enforcement and society since independence from colonial rule. The policemen had gone to sleep with their boots on as if they somehow knew that they had to be ready for action. Still, hardly anything could have prepared them for the deadly morning attack on their station by the notorious gang leader Sandakan and his cronies. When the gun smoke had cleared, three policemen lay dead. The Olympic Gardens police station was on fire and the weapons storeroom had been looted. It was discovered much later that a serving policeman living in the Olympic Gardens area had actually seen Sandakan and his gang making the Molotov cocktails and he failed to report the matter to his superiors. He was subsequently dismissed from the police force. Or it all went down according to the police. The Olympic Gardens Police Station is situated in the parish of St. Andrew South Division, a somewhat hostile environment. The building is solidly constructed and comprised two floors. The upper floor is the sleeping quarters of person at the station. The ground floor houses the guard room, strong room and the lockup. The rear and the side of the premises are secured by 8 feet to 10 feet concrete walls. Wayne Smith, otherwise called Sandokan, was the leader of a gang operating in Olympic Gardens, Waterhouse, Kalalo Bed and Riverton City areas. He was wanted by the Olympic Gardens police on several counts of shooting and wounding with intent, as well as other offenses. Despite the best efforts of the Olympic Gardens police, Sandokan managed to avoid capture. On November 18, 1986, at about 11 a.m., a police party including D.C. Archibald Robinson carried out a raid on a house in Eastwood Park Gardens occupied by Sandakan's girlfriend. 
Sander Khan was supposed to be hiding in there. He was not there when the police arrived. It was said the police applied pressure on the girlfriend to elicit information which would lead to Sander Khan's arrest. Sander Khan later turned up at his girlfriend's house and was told about the action of the police. He was very angry and sought to take revenge on the Olympic Gardens police. He returned to Waterhouse and with certain members of his gang, namely Nicholas Henry and Kenneth Worms, planned the attack on the station. Firstly, they drew a plan of the station, then they built a number of Molotov cocktail bombs. And lastly, they gathered their weapons in preparation for the attack. About 1 a.m. on November 19, 1986, the marauders arrived at the station to carry out their evil intent. By then, others had joined forces with Sandokan, Henry and Worms. At that particular time, D.C. Robinson was the station guard. The guard room was locked and Robinson was having a nap at the desk. Sergeant Ezra Cummings, Constable Thomas and another constable were asleep in the barracks. Sandokan and company used a ladder to climb over the wall at the rear of the premises removed several glass louver blades from a window through which they entered the station, all armed with M16s and Molotov cocktails. Two rushed to the barracks and shot and killed the Sergeant Cummins and Constable Thomas. The other killer rushed to the guard room. The district constable, in an attempt to escape, was running through the front door when he was cut down by a bullet. He died at the entrance to the station. The killers then stole a quantity of weapons, including M16s from the strong room, and on leaving, bombed the station with the Molotov cocktails, setting off a fire on the ground floor, destroying valuable and, in many cases, irreplaceable documents and records, not to mention the damage to the building. A constable who was upstairs in the barracks with Cummins and Thomas managed to secrete himself in a safe place and escape unhurt. He alerted police control. The fire brigade put out the blaze. A team of investigators and forensic personnel was shot on the scene. It was ugly. Just to see three of our colleagues spread eagled, washed in blood, was not a pleasant sight. But also, it was a grim reminder of the risk involved and how important it is to always be on the watch. It is a serious matter to kill a cop. To kill three in the station was not to be taken lightly. And to make matters worse, there were so many high-powered weapons now in the hands of these terrorists. The situation demanded swift and decisive action. Every available cop from Mobile Reserve Flying Squad and within the division of the St. Andrew South was deployed. The immigration officers at both international airports were alerted. The news media were brought on board. Every serving policeman was alerted. A command post was set up at Hunts Bay Police Station with the late SSP Donald Knight, SSP Hibbert, and Assistant Superintendent Donald Brown at the helm. Other frontline officers on the ground included Deputy Superintendent Garnet Daly, Assistant Superintendent Tony Hewitt, Inspector Donald Pusey, Inspector Kelsa Small, Detective Sergeant Cornwall Biggerford, and Detective Sergeant Derek Cowboy Knight. One of the Molotov cocktails thrown into the station had failed to explode. The fingerprint expert recovered a fingerprint from it. It belonged to Kenneth Worms. This was a very important clue which led a police party to a house in Waterhouse. During a confrontation, Worms was shot and killed by the police. A number of weapons, including one M16, was recovered. The next breakthrough came later that day, when Nicholas Henry was caught, again, in Waterhouse. A number of weapons stolen from the Olympic Gardens police station was recovered. Henry was escorted to CIB headquarters in Kingston. He cooperated fully with the investigators. Cautioned, he gave a lengthy statement outlining a full account of the attack on the station and the murder of the three policemen. All our efforts were now directed towards the apprehension of Sandokan. A raid was carried out where he was supposed to be hiding. He was not there. But the plan of the Olympic Gardens police station was found there, a most valuable exhibit it proved to be. One week after the bare-faced invasion of the police station, the gangster, who managed to get past local customs officials, was held aboard a departing flight at the Sangster International Airport. A popular artist at the time had his passport seized and was barred from entering the United States and the United Kingdom after local police accused him of assisting the fugitive in his flight from justice. The ban was lifted several years later after the artist were created a huge demand for his performances overseas. Sandokan was then dragged before the court after being charged with the triple murder of the cops. However, before he could be sentenced, he managed to escape. On September 17, 1987, Sandokan escaped from the lockup at the home circuit court where he was taken to be pleaded for trial 
on charges of murdering the three policemen. The following day, as a result of reports floating in and around Olympic Gardens and concentrated efforts by the police to recapture the fugitive, Sandokan turned himself in accompanied by his attorney. At the time, popular talk on the street was that he had powerful backers linked to the drug trade, who had managed to corrupt prison warders and police officers who had aided in his escape. According to Sandra Conway questioned, a man had visited his cell and told him he was free to go home. He left and took a bus home. Then while their relative convinced him it was a setup by the police to kill him, that was why he turned himself in. But police reports were to the contrary. A plan by Sandra Conway was spiked by the Olympic Gardens police, who got wind of a secret wedding to enable Sandra Conway to leave for England. The supposed bride at last from Britain was promptly whisked away and taken to the British High Commission by the Olympic Gardens Police before any such plan could have been executed. So the trial did take place. Sandokan and Henry each gave unsworn statements from the prisoner's dock. The in-camera trial lasted eight days in the Home Circuit Court. They denied that they took part in the attack on the police station or that they had anything to do with it at all. Sandokan claimed he was beaten by the police and forced to sign a statement. He denied that he was held at the Sanctuary International Airport. On March 17, 1988, after retiring for half an hour, the jury returned a guilty verdicts on each of the three counts of murder against each accused. The sentences of death were then pronounced. Wayne Smith, otherwise called Sandokan, 26-year-old laborer, was defended by Linton Gordon, while Nicholas Henry, laborer of Olympic Gardens, was defended by Derek Darby. June 9, Sandokan and Francis Beckford, otherwise called Prentice, Labour 54 Penwood Crescent Olympic Gardens were convicted in the Home Circuit Court of murdering Eddie Kerniff, 20, of Olympic Gardens. This murder took place on October 15, 1986, following gang warfare in the area. Sandokan's defense at trial was an alibi. He said that on October 15, he remained at home for the entire day and night, and on the day of the alleged killing, he cooked chicken and rice for his wife. In the night, he boiled mint tea for her because his wife was pregnant and was not feeling well. He said he did not leave home from October 15, 1986 until November 17, 1986 after his wife had a baby. Sander Conu described himself as a hood carver, told of carving a coat of arms with his wife and himself in the center while at home, and he presented the carving with the Jamaica coat of arms in court. Sander Conu's wife testified on his behalf. Beckford's defense was also an alibi. He claimed he was at Grand Spen Road when the killing occurred. Sentence of death was pronounced on each accused in this case. June 15, Sandakan managed to escape from the St. Catherine District Prison, now called the St. Catherine Adults Correctional Center, and went back into the community of Waterhouse and its environs, where he was shielded by the residents who welcomed his presence in their midst. Four prison warders suspended as a result. July 12, Sandakan shot and wounded by the police on Spanish Town Road near to Riverton City. He escaped and obviously survives. July 27, Sandakan armed with an M16 rifle meets Moses Bent, 25, otherwise called Breda, on a track in Riverton City. Rifle in hand, he called out to Bent by name. A woman who was walking with Bent ran when she saw the gun. Sandakan then turned the weapon on Bent and shot him. He died on the spot. Bent had been returning from his pig farm in Riverton City. July 31, Sandakan and his gang took Robert Winter, 16 of Trelawney Avenue, Riverton City, from his house and accusing him of having given information to the police. Later, they tied him to an old car and stoned him to death. Two months after his flight from prison, the police had accused Sandakan of committing nine murders. All efforts were again concentrated towards Sandakan's recapture. He moved from community to community with the police hot on his trail. Sander Khan from intelligence was regrouping with fellow cronies and at the same time committing various crimes. According to intelligence, Sander Khan was now operating from Riverton City, which was also the base of the feared Natty Morgan gang. This move by Sander Khan brought on continuous police operations in Riverton to the displeasure of Natty Morgan. Despite the state's efforts to nab or snuff out the life of the most wanted hoodlum, it was fellow gunmen who managed to end Sandakan's life just one year and ten months after he had orchestrated the attack on the police. Sandakan's body was found in bushes in the community of Tower Hill. It had multiple gunshot wounds, believed to have been inflicted by members of Natty Morgan's gang. 
it was hot in the lips of the residents of the area that Sander Khan was causing the security forces to apply too much pressure on the community and was killed so the police could relax the pressure. The police, relieved that the man who had caused them many headaches, had been extinguished, scraped up his remains and publicly displayed the fugitive's body. Soon after Sander Khan's death, the police pressure on Waterhouse was not so intense, residents say. Sander Khan escaped the justice pronounced early in the Home Circuit Court, but jungle justice prevailed. JBN, we keep you informed. Please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave us a comment and click the notification bell to receive our daily uploads.